Hallelujah. Father, we love you tonight. We honor you tonight in this house. We honor you tonight in this place. Father, you are an awesome God. You are an amazing God. You are a mighty God. And we worship and magnify you from our hearts, Father. We worship you tonight. We lift up our praise to you tonight, O oh God. We declare that you are the righteous God, that you are the everlasting one, that you are the truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We declare that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you, Father that you are our Father, you are our Heavenly Father, and we trust you and we lean on you, we rely on you tonight, Father. We praise you in this place tonight, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you are our sanctuary. You are our sanctuary, and we, we run to you, Father. We run to you, we trust you. We trust you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for Holy Ghost. We thank you for Holy Ghost being with us and in us. We thank you, Father God, that Holy Ghost is here to teach us and guide us, to help us as we learn how to surrender ourselves, to surrender our lives to you, to another degree, to another level of obedience, of servanthood to you, Father. We worship you in this place tonight, God, and we thank you for your sweet presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Make sure you greet one another before y'all sit down. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> you are good, Father. You are good. You are good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Before we get started tonight, we want to lift up um, Stephanie Norton to you. She's um, battling some physical things, and she got a not-so-good report this week. But, you know, we just we have a, a great and mighty God. Amen. We know that Jesus Christ himself has already borne her infirmity and carried her disease, and with his stripes she is healed. Amen. We got Brother Eddie sitting right back there who was on his deathbed just a couple months back, but God. Amen. But God. And the fact that God is a healing God and that he is a mighty God, he's powerful, amen, and that whatever his report is supersedes any report from the doctor. Amen. So, Father, we just lift Stephanie to you right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, first of all, that you, you have already provided her healing. You have already provided it on the cross. We say that the healing power of God has already been released into her body. We thank you, Lord, that with the stripes of Jesus, she has already been made healed and whole. We speak to her body now, and we command it to line up with the word of God. We say that by the stripes of Jesus, she's healed, she's healed, she's healed, she's healed. We command every organ in her body, every muscle, cell, and tissue. We command every organ in her body to line up with the word of God. We plead the blood of Jesus over her now. We thank you, Father God, that she will live and not die, that she will declare the works of the Lord. We thank you, Father God, that you have promised her a long and prosperous life on this earth. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all the promises that you have towards her that are yes and amen. We thank you, Lord, that you who have begun a good work in her will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father God, that she is above this situation. She is the head. She is not the tail. She's above only and not beneath. We thank you, Father, for triumph. We thank you that you always lead her in victory. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord. That your word, your word, your word declares that she is healed. And we just say that along with you and with your word that she is healed. She is the healed of the Lord. We thank you for it tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we also speak peace to her mind. We speak peace in the name of Jesus. We say peace, be still in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the peace of God that passes all understanding, that guards her heart and her mind with Christ, by Christ Jesus. I thank you, Father, for supernatural peace. 
Father, we also speak to her doctors in Jesus' name. We thank you for the wisdom of Almighty God in operation in their practice. We thank you, Father God, that the wisdom of God will dictate what the Word of God has already declared, that she is healed, that she is healed, that she is healed. And Father, we thank you for your outcome. We believe your report, Father. And whose report do we we believe? We believe your report tonight, Father. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All righty. Well, it's good to be here with you guys tonight. And, uh, you know, I don't know, just the, the weird things, weird things. The enemy just really trying in all kinds of ways to, to disrupt, to interrupt, to cause chaos and confusion, to bring death and destruction. But at every turn, at every turn, he's defeated. Amen. He is already a defeated foe. Jesus has already, has already defeated him. Jesus has attained the victory for us. And all we have to do is hold on to that victory. We hold on to it with our faith. We hold on to it with our confession of our faith. Amen. We hold on to it with our actions, with our deeds, with, with the, all, all that we have. We hold on to the victory that Jesus Christ has already attained for us. Amen. Those of you who don't know, last Wednesday night, I mean, it just is a week ago already, it just seems impossible, but last Wednesday night, right near the end of service, you know, there was a really loud crack of thunder, and, you know, and I said something like, thank God for the rain. Well, little did I know that right at that moment that, you know, lightning hit the fence back here when Anessa was shutting the gate, and it zapped her, and, um, and you know, that was, it was... It was scary, but not scary at the same time, because there was like this overriding peace, you know, that we, that we can trust God. She's standing here. She's sitting here. She's alive, you know, and so we're just believing God. But at the same time, it was kind of like, I know it was, you know, for her and for Eric and for, you know, for lots of people, it was still like a, a wake-up call. You know, we got to be really diligent, because the enemy's serious about this stuff. The enemy does not like us. Amen. The enemy does not like you. He doesn't like me. He doesn't like this church. He doesn't like this ministry. He doesn't like the things that we stand for. He doesn't like the fact that we are not just, you know, willing to come in and play church and, you know, pat each other on the back and shake one another's hand and go on our merry way and not do anything else. He doesn't like the fact that we are here to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Amen. And to provide an opportunity for God's people to be supernaturally transformed into effective disciples for Christ so that we believe that every person in this territory has an opportunity provided to them from God for their lives to be transformed, for their lives to be changed. And so everything that we do around here is all about transformation. Amen. It's all about change. And so it puts pressure on the religious system. It puts pressure on, you know, demonic forces. It puts pressure. And, you know, the enemy, he's, he tries to push back and he's been pushing back and he's been pushing back you know, for the past several months, there have been many things that have been unexpected things, you know, strange things, things that have, you know, that have happened. But yet, don't you, it can't, I mean, we're still moving forward. You know, we're still on the advance. I mean, we're still in, we're still in battle formation. Amen. We're still standing. We're still going forward. And, um, you know, and I just, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's around the next bend, but I know that, you know, the word says that we need to be, um, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Amen. We need to be diligent because we have an adversary who is the devil who goes about seeking whom he may devour. He's as a roaring lion. He goes about seeking whom he may devour. And, you know, sometimes you just got to get up in the morning and just look at yourself in the mirror and say, self, you are not getting devoured today. Not today. Not today. You know? And so, you know, I don't, I, it was just, you know, it's kind of like a wake up call for me. I've thought about it so often. I've been so grateful, so deeply grateful that Anessa was not harmed any more than she was a little singed around the edges, you know, a little crispy, but, uh, but, um, but not harmed any more than she was so deeply grateful for that. But at the same time, it's like, there's this, okay, hello, you know, we need to be on guard. Amen. We need to be watchful and we need to be diligent. So, and I believe that the things that, you know, we've been talking about here on Wednesday night for the past few weeks, I think that that, if, as we continue to meditate on this idea or this, this understanding of what it is to surrender more deeply to God, more deeply to Him, to His plan, His purpose, His call of, on our lives, I think that as we continue to give ourselves to Him, to God, amen, to greater levels, to deeper levels, I believe that that also will increase our awareness of spiritual things. I believe that it will um, help us 
to be more watchful, to be more mindful, to be more aware um, of the, the strategies that the enemy is trying to work against us. Amen. And so I think that, you know, I think that learning how to surrender and understanding what it is to surrender to God, I think that this is, um, this is one of those things, one of those tools that we all need to sharpen. Amen. We all need to uh, take it out of our toolbox, spiritual toolbox, every once in a while and say, okay, how am I doing on this area right here? You know, do I need to hone this a good bit? And, and the fact of the matter is, is that we all do. And so um, we've been talking about Peter, the Apostle Peter, and, um, and just who he is, who he was, what kind of a man he was, what um, kind of a hot-headed, stubborn, <laughs> hard-headed, pig-headed, you know, self-strong-willed, you know, none of that rings a bell for any of you guys, right? So, um, you know, but what kind of a person he was, and really when it, what it comes down to is that he is exactly the kind of person that would have been right here at Gateway had he been alive <laughs> right now in 2014, then he would be right here with us because, you know, he's just, he's just like all the rest of us, right? I mean, he's, he's hard-headed, he's gung-ho, He's, you know, ready to go out and tackle the world, and sometimes he'll just go out running without realizing, what. wait a minute, <laughs> hold up, where am I going again, what am I doing? <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I just, I, I just, the more I've meditated on him and his life and his story and the things that he's done, the more I, I appreciate um, the, the lesson that the Lord left us by telling us all about his story, Right? Rather than us just sitting here looking at Peter like, oh, he was just a goofy, you know, he was a mess up. I mean, he just, you know, he was, he didn't pay attention. He just talked before he, you know, he should, you know, all those kind of things. But instead it's like, well, yeah, but he's, you know, he's such a good example, such a good model to us. So let's, um, we're going to start again in uh, Matthew chapter 16 tonight. And we're going to kind of go forward. We've talked about some of this a little bit, but we're just going to kind of pick up where we right close to where we left off last week. And, you know, we were talking last week about how Peter, you know, he, he did some certain things. I mean, you know, he had enough faith to follow. He had enough, enough, enough faith to surrender to the point to where he was, you know, willing to leave his family business, follow after the Lord. Um, he had enough faith to walk out on the water. Um, he had enough faith to, to, you know, under, to, to know that he needed to, that some things needed to change in order for him to understand the parables that Jesus was talking about rather than just smiling and nodding and pretending like he knows what Jesus was talking about. He was like, wait a minute, what's that? Wait, one second, could you please explain that? Everybody else is like, oh yeah, sure, I know what that means, you know, but they had no idea what it meant until Peter was willing to speak up and say, look, we need you to explain this to us better. So we talked some about some of those things, and we also read in uh, Matthew chapter 16, we read already the part about how Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, and, and the Lord said to him, you know, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, and um, went on to explain that the revelation of Jesus as the Christ, that that is the foundation of the church, and um, on that foundation of that revelation is what the church of, the church of Jesus Christ is built on. Amen. So I want to just kind of pick up here then with, um, in, chap- in uh, chapter 16, verse 21, we did read this last week, but this is where we're going to start again. He said, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Everybody say, be killed. No, everybody say, be killed. be killed. Thank you. And be raised the third day. So then Peter took him aside. Okay. Now Jesus is like, you know, he's already, Peter has already understood and recognized that Jesus is the Christ. Okay. Okay. So he already knows that, that Jesus has this divine nature. He already knows that. And even with that understanding, that public confession of Jesus as Christ, Jesus says, okay, now that you know who I am, then surely if you know the law and the prophets, you know why I'm here. Because it already had been prophesied why he was here. So he's like, okay, well, surely now you understand my purpose. You understand. So now that you understand who I am, then I'm going to be free to talk more openly about God's plan for my life. And these are the things that I'm going to have to do. I'm going to go and I'm going to suffer at the hands of the religious people and they will kill me, but I will be raised up on the third day. So he begins to tell and to explain these things. And Peter, who had just said, I know that you are divine. I know that you are the, the manifested God in human form. I know that this is who you are. 
And yet he still, even with that understanding, he still felt the need to take him aside and say, um, I'm going to, no, Jesus, this is not the way it is. See, I mean, you might be God and everything, but you don't know everything, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I know you think you're God because we just admitted that, yes, you are God, but, I, but obviously, you know, you're just operating out of the man side of your brain right here because that cannot happen. Well, I mean, I know that we look at Peter and we're like, well, how can he do that? But how many times have you and I stood in front of God and said, God, you don't know what you're doing. This cannot be you. This cannot be your plan. This cannot be the way it's supposed to go down. I'm not supposed to be here in Carnesville, Georgia for the rest of my life. That's not supposed to happen. You know, I mean, I'm not supposed to do this or I'm not supposed to do that. This is, you know, these, I, I was supposed to be with these people and with these, you know, this move of God and doing this job and in this location and, you know, having this much X number of dollars and I'm supposed to have this relationship or that relationship. All these things are the way it was supposed to happen. This cannot be you. And see, that's what we do. We stand when the minute that something happens, even though we know we believe in God, we have faith in God, we love God. And we believe in his call, his plan, his purpose, all of those things. We only believe up to the degree that we can. But the very minute that he begins to speak to us about things that we don't understand and things that do not seem possible or things that, that seem contrary to what our own personal vision is of what his plan is for our lives, then we start to rebuke God. We do it. And I'm going to say we because I have to believe I am not the only person in the room who does it. You know? I mean, I cannot tell you how many conversations like this I have had with God over the last 17 years, driving down the road, rebuking God, sitting up here on the altar by myself, rebuking God, pacing around this room sometimes for hours, praying and rebuking God, you know, until I finally have to just sit down and just start, you know, laughing and crying at the same time and go, okay, I'm sorry. You're right. Okay. I'm sorry. I yield. I surrender. But you know, but these are the things that we do. Because we don't understand. I don't understand why my kids are going crazy, why my husband's going crazy, my wife's going crazy, my family's going crazy. I don't understand why I got laid off or why I got fired or why, you know, I lost my business or I lost my house. I don't understand why these things are happening to me. I don't understand why my friend died. I don't understand why my child died. I don't understand, you know, why these things are going on in my life. So surely, you know, it, it must be that, you know, there's something wrong with God. Okay, well, there's nothing wrong with God. God has a perfect plan for our lives, but we have an adversary who is the devil. And, you know, he will come to try to steal, kill, and destroy at every single opportunity that he possibly can. It's, us to, it's up to us to surrender more to God, to surrender more to God. You know, Peter is the one. He came, and we'll read this, you know, in the Word in a few minutes, but he's the one who has that beautiful revelation of humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. He learned that right here. He's the one that said, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Peter's the one who said that. Where did he learn it? By making these mistakes, by making these same mistakes that you and I make today. So how can we learn what he learned? Well, we can, you know, first of all, we can use this word as a mirror. Amen. Amen. And we can be honest with ourselves, we can be truthful, and we can say, yes, I do that right there. I do that right there. And so if I will learn how to repent, if I will learn how to receive correction in the same way that Peter learned how, if I'll learn how to, you know, to take that correction from God and turn, turn my life and turn my thinking, if I learn how to surrender like he did, then the same revelation will be real to me so that I can humble myself under the mighty hand of God and watch and wait 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 for him to exalt you in due time because due time is never your time, never. And just when you're like, okay, any second now, due time is coming. I know it, it's coming. Okay, this year, okay, midnight. This year at midnight on New Year's Eve, then it's going to be due season. I know it. I just feel it. I got a prophecy. I got a goosebump. I know it's going to happen. It's going to be this year. Well, due season, the very, what I've learned about God is that the very minute that I think that it's going to happen right now, then I just might as well sit back and go, well, never mind, because it's not going to happen right now. It's going to happen on a sudden, in a twinkling of an eye, when I'm not expecting it, it's going to creep up on me, and then it will have happened, and it'll already have happened, and I'll think, oh, wait a minute. 
that's already, that changed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so we just, we have to understand that, that this, this process of surrender, you know, that Peter learned, it started right here with these things, with him, first of all, being rebuked and being called. He, Jesus said, you know, Peter said to him, verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. I mean, I know you're God and everything, but surely you don't know everything. And then verse 23 Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. Now, he had just said, you're blessed. You're Simon Barjona. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Now we're going to call you Peter. And on the rock of your revelation, we're going to build the church. On the rock of this revelation that you just had, we're going to build the church. And not five seconds later, he's calling him Satan. (laughs) God shows favoritism to no man. You know what I'm saying? You are an offense to me. That word offense, it just means a stumbling block. Anything that gets in your way, anything that tries to trip you up. You know, in other places, the word says that, you know, it's better for somebody to have a millstone hung around their neck than for them to be a stumbling block to one of his little ones, to someone who's immature in the Lord, not just a child. I mean, a child, but then also someone who's a child in the Lord. It's better to have a millstone hung around your neck. Have you ever seen a millstone? If you go to, um, I like to go when um, we go up t- towards the mountains over here, you know, near Helen and stuff. I like to stop at Nora Mill Granary. Have you all, any of y'all ever been there? They got the best grits. If you like grits, you need to go there and buy their grits. This is not a commercial. But, <laughs> but I love it. I like going in there because it is an old-fashioned grist mill, okay? And so they have this millstone that's, I mean, the thing has got to weigh like four or 5,000 pounds. I mean, it's humongous. I mean, it's like a cross from me to Roy, you know, and it's this big old round stone, and it just grinds all day. I mean, it just is on this whole old-fashioned contraption, and what do they do? They grind meal with it. And, you know, that's a millstone. What happens if you put that joker on your neck? You go into the bottom of the ocean. It doesn't matter if you're standing right here in Carnesville, Georgia. You get that thing on your neck, you're still going to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> you're going to sink right through to China. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know that thing, you put that thing on your neck and you're going down, buddy. But, you know, but that's what an offense is. It's something that is a stumbling block. It's something that, that tries to, to keep someone from fulfilling God's plan for their life. See? I mean, we use that word, oh, I got offended all the time. When that just means that you got your feelings hurt. That's not the same thing. Getting your feelings hurt, getting mad, you know, getting your pride hurt a little bit, that's not the same thing as what real offense is. Real offense is when someone puts a stumbling block in your path to try to keep you from the plan that God has for your life. So anyway, so here he is, okay? Jesus has just explained to him that he, that this, this tactic that he's taking of trying to tell God what he's supposed to do, that, you know, trying to get Jesus off of the plan, the perfect plan that God has for the redemption of all mankind, that that is an offense. And he goes on and he says to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, you've got to be willing to lay your life down no matter what your cross is. Take it up. Follow after him. See, we don't have, none, nobody in here has to die for the sins of mankind. That's already been done. So he wasn't saying to them, you know, go, you know, chop down a couple trees and form yourself a cross and drag it around behind after me, boys. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about metaphorically, whatever it is that you need to die on in order for the perfect plan of God to be resurrected in your life, be willing to do that. Be willing to do that. That follow him in obedience is what he was talking about. Follow him in submission to God's plan for his life. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about follow me to the hill and jump up there on the cross. That's not what he was talking about. These crazy people, crazy people. There are crazy people in this world. Crazy people. Every year, Easter time, you know, especially in South America, Central America areas, you know, you can go online and you can see people, you know, every year at Easter time that they get themselves nailed to a cross. Why would they do that? Because they're insane. But because they, you know, they have, mis- they have mistaken this passage of Scripture because they do not understand what it really means to surrender yourself to God. 
They think if they, you know, let somebody nail them to a cross for a few hours, then they're following after Jesus. No. God's, I guarantee you that God's perfect plan for their life does not involve them getting nailed to a cross every year on Easter. I guarantee it. Amen. And so whatever it is that they're missing out on, whatever it is they're not doing because they're so busy being religious and being deceived and being crazy, then, you know, then whatever it is that they're not doing, they're missing out on that. Amen? Amen. So he says, but whoever desires to save his life will lose it. So he's, he's teaching Peter a lesson. You know, Peter's like, no, you're not going to die. And he's saying, if you desire to save your life, in other words, if you desire to keep the life that you have planned for yourself instead of trading your life that you have planned for yourself for the life that God has planned for you, then you're going to lose that life too. You're going to lose that life too. That's why when you see people that have a call of God on their life, they've got a call of God on their life, they submit themselves to God up to a certain point. But then there's that one point where God's like, okay, now take this next step. And they're like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love my life more than the life you've chosen for me. Then you know what? They lose that life. They lose it. They get tripped up. Because that's the, the point where you walk to and you say, no, I'm not going any farther. From that point on, you're backsliding. Amen. And so the hand of God cannot protect you in that place anymore. And so his, he, have to, he takes his hand off of you, and here comes that roaring lion, right, to devour you because there's no protection over you because you are not submitted to God anymore. See, because when you're, the plan that you have for your life becomes more important than the God, the, the God plan for your life, then God is not obligated to protect you anymore. Do you hear me? It's important to surrender to God in spite of situation. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. How many of y'all just, you know, you can think about from the time that you were born again until now? It doesn't matter if that was last week or 20 years ago or 80 years ago or however long ago it was. You know, but think about the things that you have been able to do in your life in Christ that you never imagined for yourself. You never dreamed that you would be able to do such things. You never dreamed that you would be able to have an impact on people's lives, that you would be able to help other people. You never dreamed that you would be able to do certain things because it wasn't part of the plan that you had for your life, but it was part of God's design, right? So you have found, you have discovered a part of your life that you didn't even know existed. That's because it only exists in Christ, See, and as long as you're walking in Christ, as long as you're following after Christ, then that part of your life that he has for you, you continue to find it. You know, that's why we say around here all the time, you're not going to be the same person this time next year. You should be changed for the better. Every single one of you should be changed for the better. The reason is because as the more we submit to the life of God in our lives manifesting, then those things, that life, we find pieces of our life that he has intended for us that we didn't even know. There are things that I know that I will do that I am, cannot even think of right now. I know that. I know that, you know, next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, I will be able to look back and say, wow, you know, in 2014, I never would have imagined myself doing that. I wouldn't have been able to do that then. Why? Because there's new life springing forth. As long as I'm submitted to God and his plan for my life, as long as I've surrendered, then newness of life comes. Can you see that? Okay, so he's explaining this, and then he says again, um, Jesus says in verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, so he's trying to teach Peter. It's not just that he's rebuking him and calling him the devil, saying he's an offense, and then walking away. But he's trying to teach him and the other disciples as well, look, it's, you know, it's more important for you to submit yourself to God's plan for your life than to do anything else. Because that is the only way that you are going to really find your life. The only way. It's the only way. My grandfather... On my mother's side, um, you know, he was my Quaker grandfather. And even though he grew up attending Quaker meeting, he read his Bible um, every day. He, you know, he lived um, a life of goodness. He lived a life of, you know, like a, a chaste kind of a life. I mean, you know, he lived the kind of life that if you looked at him from the outside, you would say that person is a Christian. He lived a Christian life, but he was not born again. 
okay? He had, you know, he had the religion of his fathers and his forefathers. He had that. He was a good man. He was a very good man, okay? But he wasn't born again until he was 90 years old, 90 years old. Now, you would think that by the time somebody's 90 years old, that even if they met Jesus, they probably wouldn't change too much because by the time you're 90, I mean, what else you got left to do, right? I mean, you know, they're, you're, you think I'm, they're not going to really change that much. But I want to tell you something. As I've witnessed, I witnessed myself, my grandfather was a totally changed man. He was a good man before he met Jesus, before he really knew Jesus. But he was, I mean, you could just see you could see Christ on him. You could see Jesus in him. And he completely changed. He changed the way that he, you know, that he would talk to people, talk about people. He, I mean, his heart changed. Everything was different. You could see it. His last five years, you could see the difference in his life. Amen. So, you know, and that's what this is talking about. I mean, he lived a life that was a good life by anybody's standards. And anybody who does not know what the word says would have thought he was a Christian. But he was not born again until he became born again when he was 90 years old. And then he changed. So what I'm talking about here is that Peter, you know, he had to, he had to get this correction. And if we are going to learn how to surrender, we're going to have to be able to take this correction. You know, and the thing that I've come to learn about correction is you can take your correction from the Word. It's the best way to do it. You can look at the Word. You can look at it with honesty, you can look at it humbly, you can look at it and say, oh God, I see myself in that. Please help me, Holy Ghost. Please help me change so that I am conformed to this word. You know, you can look at it that way. You can receive correction from the word and transformation from the word and through prayer, right? You can do that on your own. But if you don't do that on your own, then guess where correction is going to come from? Then it's going to be more like Jesus saying to Peter in public, in front of all of them, you are Satan. Get behind me. You're an offense to me. That's when things start happening in a public way. We have a choice, okay? I prefer, I have learned how to prefer this way. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, just Holy Ghost, be my teacher, be my intercessor, be my God. Help me understand. Help me see. Examine my heart, oh God, and show me. So when I run across things in the Word that, you know, that cause me to, to go, wait a minute, I'm not like that. Wait a minute, something's missing. Wait a minute, I don't, the mirror of myself does not line up with this. So when I run across that, teach me, Lord, how to change, right? How to be conformed to the Word. Because, you know, that's something we can learn from Peter, right? So anyway, so, here's, so here he gets this rebuke and everything, but he hangs in there. This is why we love him. It's not like he, you know, hung his head and went back home to his mama, right? He didn't go back home to daddy's fishing business. He didn't leave. He didn't say, fine, I got my feelings hurt. You know, that pastor over there, he called me the devil, so I'm leaving. I'm going back. I'm going back to my old church. I'm going back to my old ways. I'm going to go do things the way I want to. I'm just going to pack it up and go. No, he didn't do that. He hung in there with Jesus. And the cool thing about that is that Jesus hung in there with him. In the next chapter... Here we have the, you know, the transfiguration on the mount. You know, I mean, Jesus, the, the cool thing about this is that Jesus knew and understood that Peter was important. He was significant. He believed in Peter. He recognized God's call on his life. He knew that there was something powerful and anointed on this man that was going to shape and change the world. And so even though he had just made this drastic error... Jesus didn't hold it against him. No, Jesus knew he's going up on this mountain here. He's going to be transfigured. And who does he take with him? Well, he takes with him James and John and Peter. Okay? Well, Peter, just being Peter, <laughs> they go up on this mountain in chapter 17. And um, in verse, we'll just start in verse 1. It says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Now, you know, if you read this, you know, this kind of account in the book of John, John always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, well, you know he's going to take the disciple that he loved up on the mountain because he loved him the best, right? Well, you know, I mean, he did take him and his brother, his hard-headed brother. These are the sons of thunder, right? I mean, these guys, they were always arguing about who's going to be the greatest, sit on the right hand and the left hand of God, you know, that kind of thing. 
And Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not so convinced that he loved them the most as much as he was afraid to leave them alone away from everybody else. I got to keep my eye on these boys. I got to take them with me, you know. So here we go. We're going up on the mountain. Peter's going to say something, going to get himself in trouble. James and John are going to get everybody else mad at them because they're going to be talking about how God loves me the best. I'm going to be on the right hand of God. So I can't leave these three guys down here. I'm going to take them up on the mountain with me. I don't know. We'll ask them when we get there. Anyway, he gets there. Um, up to the mountain by themselves. In, ch- in verse 2, it says, And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So Peter answered. I mean, nobody said nothing to Peter, right? But he answered anyway. I mean, you know how some people are. I, did I ask you a question? No, I don't think so. Well, what are you answering me for? Why are you talking to me? But anyway, Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was the only one talking. <laughs> I love Peter. He's the only one talking. You know, I mean, here Jesus is just, I mean, I don't, what would you do? I mean, you know, Jesus is completely transfigured into his divine self right here in front of your eyes. And not only that, but Moses, not some dude dressed up like Moses, right? Not the guy who's at the bus station in downtown Atlanta. I mean, not that guy, but for real Moses, like legit Moses, right? I mean, he's Moses shows up, Elijah shows up, and they're right there, just like these three people on the front row right here. They're right there. What would you do? What would you do? I mean, I would be in awe, right? I mean, wouldn't you be in awe? Wouldn't you just be in complete and total and utter amazement? But no, Peter's going to start talking. You know, so what does he do? He says, well, we're going to, this is great that we're here because now, excuse me, now that we're here, we know what to do. Now we're going to build a tabernacle for all of (laughs) y'all. And God is like, you know, while he was still speaking, God didn't even wait for him to shut up, right? It was like, while he is still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, (laughs) this is, Jesus didn't have to answer for himself. Jesus did not rebuke Peter this time. It was God the Father. Okay, you don't get the rebuke the first time from the Son then God the Father is going to speak to you out of the heavens. Now this, you would, would, did he learn the first time? No. Did he learn the second time? No. God the Father speaks to him out of a cloud and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And see, you know, Moses and Elijah, they just show up because it's the law and the prophets. You know, I mean, that's what they're there. They're representing the law and the prophets. It was the time of the end of the law and the prophets. Jesus said that the law and the prophets were until John. But from the time of John, what was preached? The gospel of the kingdom. Okay. And so here, you know, here is this major thing. It's like the baton being passed, right? So Moses and Elijah, they show up at the moment that the full glory manifestation of the, you know, the son of the living God, you know, demonstrating here that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so the time of the prophets is done away with. And so now all we have to do is listen to Jesus. But Peter, he's wanting to like build a, t- build a tabernacle to everybody. You know what that tells me? It tells me that he did not know the difference between the law and the prophet and Jesus. He didn't know the difference between the law and the prophet and kingdom. He didn't know. Okay? So he's just, you know, to him, it's all the same. But God had to be like, no, Peter. The whole point of this is that now you're just going to listen to him. You're just going to listen to Jesus now. You're not paying attention. You're not going to keep fulfilling the law. Did Peter learn this? No. The apostle Paul had to rebuke him. You go over and you read in the book of Galatians, Peter's like, you know, hanging out with everybody and all the Gentiles. And he's like, you know, really excited that the message of the kingdom has come to the Gentiles. He's eating with them. He's fellowshipping with them. But here come the Jews, you know, down from Jerusalem. And what's Peter do? He tries to keep the law in front of them. Didn't he learn? God himself spoke to him out of heaven. Didn't he learn? No, he did not. Not at first. (laughs) Not at first. You see why he's a good example to learn how to surrender? Because if we could all just get zapped on the very first time and get it and be surrendered to God and be like, yes, I mean, we're wholly obedient. We're wholly submitted. We are wholly surrendered. We are, ev- we are never again. Or do we ever have to wrestle with our flesh? We don't, I mean, we're just completely like just so in love with God, so in love with God's plan for our lives that we don't ever fight back, talk back, think back, nothing. I mean, we're just ready to go. We're good. No, that does not happen. 
you and I know that that does not happen. We might not speak out like Peter did, but we still, we think it, you know, we're still confused. We still don't know what the kingdom is. Come on now. We're right here in the 21st century. How many people, born again people can really explain to you what is the kingdom of God? What does that even mean? The kingdom of God is at hand. Well, what, where is it? <laughs> where is it? What's it look like? What am I supposed to do? What, what, is it, what does that even mean? People don't know what that means. That's why it's important for us to talk about kingdom. That's why it's important for us to talk about the, you know, our role in establishing the kingdom of God. Why are we here? We are here to see kingdom culture established in Franklin County and all the surrounding territories. What does that even mean? People don't even know. What does that mean? All they know is kingdom, king, I don't know, it's like there's a kingdom hall up the road. What does that mean? It's nothing the same, but because people don't understand, then they can't explain it. Am I being for real or what? So, and you know, so Peter, we're not going to just, we're not going to just, you know, jump on him and be like, oh, well, you didn't get it because we still don't get it. But what we can do is we can learn from, okay, you know, we, we see the mistakes that he made. We learned that he, he hung in there again. First Jesus rebuked him and then the cloud opened up and God talked to him personally. He did not hang his head. He did not say, okay, fine. I quit. He didn't have a pity party for himself, or if he did, it's not documented. He might have, but it's not documented. So it wasn't significant enough for our Holy Ghost to say, yeah, we need to know that he had this pity party here. He kept in there, right? He hung in there. So here he is. He's hanging in there. So let's look. Um, you might want to hold your place in Matthew because we're going to come back to Matthew. But um, I want you to flip over with me to um, uh, John chapter 13. We're going to kind of go back and forth between Matthew and John here, a few different places, and um, in sequence, they're just different accounts. You know, I want you to see it different, um, all these different things. So in John chapter 13, verse 7, all right, I'm going to back up on this one too, um, because, you know, we're not in a hurry. Um, so in chapter 13, okay, verse 1, Now before the, peace, the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. See, Jesus knew he was, I mean, he knew. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew that. He, it wasn't a surprise to him. He knew that he had come from God. He knew that he was going to God. He knew what was coming to happen to him. He knew all of those things. And even though he knew he was God, he knew he had still to teach some things to his disciples. So it doesn't matter how anointed, how submitted, how, you know, committed you are to God's plan for your life, you are still obligated to serve others. You are still obligated to be a blessing to others. And so Jesus, he rose from supper, laid aside his garment, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. He was being a servant to them. And see, you got to understand, these disciples, you know, people talk about, oh, they were poor, they were wandering around. No, these guys were all businessmen. They were tax collectors and business owners. They were very profitable men. And they were used to having servants. Just go back and talk. I mean, you, you look at them, they're in, the, they're in the Word. I mean, they had servants in their households. It was a servant's job to clean the people's feet. It was a, that was servant's work, Right? I mean, you know, we look at it like, you know, custodial work where people clean toilets and where people, you know, I mean, take care of, you know, I mean, who, how would you like to be the guy whose job it is to clean out the porta potty? Do you know what I'm saying? Antoine just went, mm. Okay. Why? Because that's the kind of job that, you know, I mean, you don't, you don't wake up one morning and go, hey, I think I want a job being the person who cleans out the porta potty. That's not what you wake up doing. It's a servant's job. Okay. It's something that you do because you have to right? You do because you can't find anything else to do. In this case, that would be the reaction, okay? Um, these men, businessmen, 
they would not, you know, they wouldn't even begin to think about getting down on their knees and scrubbing the dirt and the crud off of people's feet where they had, you know, dusty roads where people walked, you know, and, and walked through donkey poo and everything else. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they're just, that was, that was something that was beneath them, but it was not beneath Jesus. So he's modeling to them. And he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Even me? I mean, I've done messed up all these times. Even me, you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. But Peter answered him and said, you shall never wash my feet. Never. But Jesus answered him and he said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now look, we're talking about surrender. Peter didn't go away and think about it for a while. And then decide, you know, to come back. He didn't go pray. He didn't do a 40-day fast to see was he going to change his mind. It was just like that. It was just like that. He said, you will never do this. And Jesus said, fine, then you have no part with me. He goes, never mind. Go ahead. Wash my feet. The next verse, he says, you know, um, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You know, don't just wash my feet. Then just give me a bath all the way. I'm right here. I am. You know, if that's what it's going to take, then just give me a whole bath. I love Peter. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. In other words, if you're already born again, okay, if you, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean, but not all of you. And he wasn't talking about Peter. Who was he talking about? He's talking about Judas. All right. So, you know, so here we have Peter, and, you know, he's, he wants, he, you know, he doesn't want the Lord to wash his feet. He doesn't want to surrender. But then Jesus is essentially telling him, unless you can accept humility working in your life, unless you can accept this, and unless you can offer yourself up to be served and to serve, then you have no part in the kingdom. That's what the kingdom is all about. The kingdom is not this, you know, hierarchy of, of man, you know, not like what we think of as kingdom, right? Not like, not like the rulership of man. The kingdom of God is all about being a servant first and foremost. You're always a servant. It doesn't matter what rank you have in the kingdom. You're a servant. Jesus is number one rank in the kingdom, correct? Yet he was a servant. And so Peter was having to learn these things, that not only do I have to receive, you know, I don't, have, have any of y'all ever had your feet washed? You've been to a foot washing and you've had your feet washed? It is a humbling experience. You know, it's a humbling experience. I don't, I don't really like people messing with my feet. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just don't. I, honestly, I don't want anybody else, I don't want anybody else touching me. I mean, you know, I would go, <laughs> you go to the hospital and, and the, the nurses want to, you know, take care of you and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, please let me do this myself. I want to do it myself, you know, but a lot, and I'm not the only one like that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I would much rather give my own self a bath and have somebody else do it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just kind of creepy, but <laughs> But the point is that if you have ever been to a foot washing, it was, I just wept. It's, I mean, I think I've been to two and I, you know, didn't, I, it was not a willing kind of a thing. I didn't want to do it because I, you know, it was weird to me. I'm just, can I just be, can I just be real? It was weird to me because I, you know, I, but the sim symbolism of it, you know, the fact that, you know, here we are and this person who is a spiritual leader to me, they're washing my feet. That was, it was very humbling to me. And so, you know, I can see that here with Peter, and he's learning this lesson. He's learning how it is to surrender to being served. It's hard. You know, one of the, one of the most difficult things for me right now, a challenge for me right now, is James, bless his heart. James is such a servant's heart. I don't even know where he went. He's going to do something for somebody is what he's doing. <laughs> But he's like, you know, the Energizer Bunny of servanthood. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he just, he is so on top of things. He's just aware. He's alert. He's like, okay, they're going to need water. They're going to need a breath strip. They're going to need a something, a mint. You know, they need something. What do you need? What do you need? And he's just like that all the time. And, you know, so often I just want to say, dude, just chill. You know, I can open my own bottle of water. It's okay. But yet it's, and, but it's a humbling thing for me because I have to, it's a gift that he has, see? 
And see, he's, he's demonstrating this willingness to serve. Well, what's hard for him is when someone else wants to serve him, right? I mean, if he was anywhere in here, he'd say, mm-hmm, because that's a hard thing for him. He doesn't, you know, and it's hard. I th- if we're all honest with each other, we would say it's just hard to receive from people in that way, you know. And so, but in order for us to learn how to surrender, we have to learn this. We have to learn it. We have to learn it too. Amen. All right. And so we're still here in John. And uh, here, let's jump on down in John chapter 13 to verse uh, 36. Same chapter, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Have you noticed? I mean, if you go back and read, read the Gospels again with this whole teaching in mind. Peter does most of the talking. I'm serious. If it's not Jesus talking, it's Peter. If it's not, if you go back there and look, he's, he talks next most to Jesus. I mean, you know, he's just always talking. He's always asking questions. He's always probing. He always wants to understand. Again, I admire that about him because I want to understand. I want to know, right? I want, I want revelation and understanding. And he's just the only one who wasn't afraid to ask, apparently. So Simon, I mean, you know, those other guys had to have their mama come ask. You know what I'm saying? I mean, James and John, they had to send their mama. Mama, go ask Jesus, can we sit next to him? Peter would be like, forget that. I'm going to ask the man myself. You know? I mean, so, but you understand. I mean, there's this whole different mentality between him and the others. So, (laughs) but... Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? See, he still doesn't know. He still doesn't understand. Even though Jesus is talking about this, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to give my life up for you. And he's like, but where are you going? I mean, you can't go anywhere because you're here to establish the kingdom. And, you know, I don't understand. Where are you going? And Jesus answered him and he says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But you shall follow me afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? He didn't just say, okay, I believe you. He's like, well, why not? I mean, that's like, you know, God's like, you know, I have much to say to you, but you cannot bear it at this time. And you're like, but why not? Why can't I bear it at this time? What's wrong with me? How come you think I can't bear it right now? God, you can tell me. Tell me anything. Come on, God, tell me. I know you can tell me right now. Yeah, okay, you just said by Holy Ghost, I have much to say to you, but you cannot bear it now. But I know I can take it. Go on, tell me. I mean, that's what Peter's doing. That's what we do. You know, we hear by, by Holy Ghost, you know, the man or the woman of God say that one scripture. You know, I've got much to share with you, but you cannot bear it now. You know, I gotta feed you with the milk of the word. You can't handle the meat. Well, what do we do? Well, we get mad. We get our feelings hurt. We were like, well, why not? How come I can't handle it right now? Well, the fact that you got to ask that answers the question. True. The fact that you're asking answers the question. So Peter's like, (laughs) he says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. I'll give you everything, he says. And Jesus answered him and he said, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. See, we only think we're ready. We only think we're surrendered. I mean, I know that I start talking about this, and there's probably a lot of people that could, you know, listen in and say, I don't need that teaching right now because I am surrendered. Peter thought he was surrendered too. He said to Jesus, I am willing to die for you. I can go where you're going right now. And Jesus, I mean, I'd like to think that maybe he laughed at Peter a little bit when he said that, ha, you only think that you can before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. All right. Now, let's see, where do we want to go? Okay. Um, Flip on with me back over to Matthew again. Um, Yeah, we've got a couple verses there, and then we'll come back to one more in John. Okay, so Matthew uh, chapter 19. Y'all doing okay? All right, Matthew 19. All right, so I mentioned this last week, but um, let's just really kind of look at it here a little bit. This is before, you know, the, the supper and everything. But, um, you know, here the rich young ruler had come in Matthew chapter 19, 
starting in verse 16, it says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And so he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one's good but one. That is God. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, Well, all these things I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, okay, perfect, being mature, right? A mature follower, not perfect like Perfect with no flaw. Perfect means mature. If you want to be mature, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The things that he had were important to him. The wealth that he had was important to him. There's always this one part of you. So you can obey to, you know, you can obey the law. You can obey the Lord, you can submit yourself to a certain place. But then what's that, what is that one thing that you're holding on to? I mean, only you and God knows, and your spouse, and maybe some other people that, you know, don't want to tell you to your face that they know. (laughs) But, you know, I mean, for the most part, only you and God knows what it is you're hanging on to. It might not be wealth, but whatever possession it is that possesses you, more than your willingness to lay it all down and follow after him, whatever that is, that's the thing that will keep you from fully entering into the kingdom. And so, you know, he's, <laughs> this guy, he goes away because he had a lot of possessions, and those possessions obviously had him. Now, you know, biblical scholars say that this young, rich young ruler here was Barnabas. And if you read in the book of Acts, Barnabas is the apostle who, you know, he, he becomes an apostle. He's the one who comes with great wealth, and he gives it all to the church. He gives it all. Okay? So, and, you know, I like, I, I like to think that biblical scholars are correct because of the story, because it just makes, you know, it, it makes it a powerful lesson. Amen? So Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. He said it's hard. He didn't say it's impossible. With, all, with God, all things are possible, right? When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? Because they were all rich. They were all wealthy. And they're like, okay, wait a minute. Hold up. You know, we've been following you all this time. And, you know, you're saying that it's hard for, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than it is for, you know, for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, then who can be saved? Who can be your disciple? And Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then Peter said, Peter answered and said to him, see, we've left all and followed you. Therefore, What shall we have? He was very concerned about his reward. Amen? Can you see that? He is, you know, he's trying to justify this self-justification. All right, well, that guy might not have been able to do it, but we've left everything. We've left it all behind. Well, you know what? There were some things that Peter had not yet left behind, right? It didn't have to be a material possession. It didn't have to be his daddy's fishing business. It didn't have to be that. There were other things that were keeping him right here where he was from being able to really submit and really enter into through that eye of the needle to really get down on his knees. You know, the eye of the needle is just a gate right in the wall there in the way that they they did it. It was like, you know, picture a camel with his hump. The eye of the needle, it looks like the eye of a needle. And what they would have to do is they would have to unladen the camels and the camel would have to get down on his knees and they would have to coax the camel on his knees through that special door. It was a matter, it was a defense mechanism, you know, it was to protect them. So in other words, you got to get down on your knees. You have to be willing to unburden yourself of whatever you're carrying, whatever that baggage is, whatever that stuff is, whatever those possessions are that you are laden down with that's keeping you from entering into the kingdom, like it keeps the camel from entering into the city, all right? That's what he's talking about. And Peter's like, okay, look, we've already, I'm justifying myself here. I mean, I know you're talking about that guy. You're not talking about me because I've already left everything for you. (laughs) 
And Jesus goes on and he talks to them and he says, you know, basically everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake, they'll receive, uh, they'll receive their blessing a hundredfold. Peter's very interested in what am I going to get? All right, what am I going to get? Not what can I give. <clears throat> Not what can I give. Not what else do I need to give you because that's what the rich young ruler was saying. What else do I lack still? Peter is like, I've already done all that. What, do I, what am I going to get now? The rich young ruler is like, I've done those things. What else do I need to do? And when Jesus told him what else he needed to do, he wasn't really quite ready to do that. On the other hand, Peter was deceived because he was saying, yeah, I've already done all that stuff. Now what do I get for it? All right. Now, there is an element here that we got to be careful of because we can get to a place in our lives where we get so familiar with God, we get so familiar with the things of God, we get, we get to the place to where we really feel like, you know, we have done something for God. And now we, we deserve a reward. Now, I believe in the rewards of God. I do. I believe in it wholeheartedly. I believe that God blesses those who are faithful to him. I believe it. I, I, I live that as, as much as I, I mean, I appreciate the blessing that, that I receive in my own life. I appreciate it. I know he blesses his people. Amen. But if we ever get to the place to where we feel like we deserve it, then we are we are carrying some baggage here that's keeping us from it. There is, there is something there in this. It's pride. You know, it's, this, it's a haughty spirit that says, I deserve more, God. I deserve better than that, God. I've done all these things for you, God. Now, where are you? And honestly, I mean, I have, I have been in this place. God, I have laid down, I have moved to some place, I have done these things, I've done, you know, I've taken this job, I've done this, I've, I've been married to this person, I've, you know, raised these kids, I've done all these things, I've done all this stuff. I've submitted to this apostle, I've submitted to this ministry, I've done, I've, done, I've jumped through X, Y, and Z hoop. I've done everything that I know to do. Now, what are you going to give me for it? Okay? I mean, now, when I have conversations with God sometimes, sometimes I just get really real with that. It's when I'm hurting. When I'm hurting badly enough to let the facade down to my own self and just be real and say, God, I think I deserve something better than this. I deserve better than this. Like you hear Apostle David talking about God. I wouldn't treat a dog that way. That's the same, the same thing. That when we get to that place, well, then we are right here in the same place where Peter is right here. Chapter 19, verse 27 of Matthew. We are not fully surrendered because we feel that he owes us something. And we do not recognize that we are laden down still with things that we have not surrendered to him. Can you see that? Can you see it in Peter? Can you see it? Okay, so then the lesson then for us is, okay, well, when we find ourselves getting to that place, I mean, you know, thankfully, so far to date, Okay, I know it'll happen again because I know me. So, but so far to date, when I've had these, you know, temper tantrum, pity parties, self-righteous, you know, just indignant, you know, kind of places, when I've reached these places, it's been cycles, you know, over the last 20 years. So when I've reached these places and I'm angry at God and I'm saying, you know, basically, I didn't, I don't deserve this. I deserve better. When are you going to, you know, you said you're God, you said this, you said that, you know, when I get to that place, I mean, I get it all out, right? And then then there's comes the breaking and then comes the place of lord i repent i'm sorry forgive me cuz obviously i'm an idiot right because otherwise i wouldn't be accusing god otherwise i wouldn't be accusing him of being an unjust father otherwise i wouldn't be accusing him of being someone that he's not the bible says that he rewards them who diligently serve him seek him right so if i was diligently seeking him then I would be receiving the reward. And if I'm not receiving the reward, then even though I might think I'm diligently seeking him, I am obviously not because he is not a liar and his word is true. So, you know, it all comes back around to you. Well, eventually, Peter, get, he, he lets it come all the way back around to him eventually, right? But we'll have to get to that next week because our time's up. So um, keep, keep thinking about Peter. Keep meditating. Read, read, read. Read First and Second Peter. Read it because it's so beautiful, especially when you really think about him in the light of this is the man he was. This in the Gospels, this is the man he was. It's so like you and I. So like me. So like, you know, any of us. So like us. 
And yet for him to come around to the place where he was able to write those things that he wrote in First and Second Peter, beautiful transformation. And that's what we're all about, right, is transformation. Amen? All right. Well, you guys be blessed. Have a great rest of your week. Friday night oasis. And uh, see you Sunday. Hallelujah.